Right, so my name's John, I'm a distiller, and I've been a distiller for about five years now. Prior to that, I worked at a brewery, which then became a brewery and a distillery. So hence, a bit of a learning curve. Right, so today we're going to talk about grain to glass, taking grain and turning it into spirit, not necessarily grain, grain but a source of starch or sugars, and how you go about doing that, and the advantages and disadvantages of that, not necessarily all advantages. Right, here we go. Right, so the advantages in doing it, it gives, you, it gives you a point of difference. If you make your own base spirit, you're the only person making that spirit. It is unique to you. So that is a, quite a good point of difference and one you can talk about. Also, if you make it in such a way, it could be a botanical that you can't, that no one else can buy. So I like to think of some of our base spirits as the 14th botanical or whatever, whichever number you happen to be using because they do have flavour. So you have total control over your recipe. No one else is going to have any input in it other than you or possibly your maltster because you can buy different grains. We'll come to that in a bit. You don't have to buy grain. Um, ability for experimentation. If you don't like it, you can change it. So you can take every recipe and modify it if you're not quite sure. Add a different type of grain, a mixture of grains, single origin, single grain malted but we'll come to that in a minute and you can produce anything if you've got the, the ability to make your own vodka and make a wash shall we say so a wash is an unferment or a fermented um, beer that has no hops in it which then becomes a neutral grain spirit it doesn't have to become a neutral grain spirit you can turn it into whiskey you can do a beer and turn it into an eau de vida beer you can ferment and distill wine cider anything we've played with most things um, in an experimental way, not necessarily in a product that's available for sale away. Okay, so there are advantages. This is a really terrible photo, but what we've done, <laughs> just in a desk in someone's office, we've actually redesigned and we're relaunching our gin and vodka. In fact, don't tell anyone it's in the vodka because it's not been launched yet. <laughs> okay, so phones away. All right, in fact, we tweeted little pictures of the label just to annoy our web team. Um, it works. How to annoy your web team 101. We can do a whole talk about that. Um, <laughs> and get marketing really excited by tweeting slight, slightly small pictures of labels. Um, thanks, whoever took that picture. <laughs> yeah, I'll go now, shall I? Um, so redesigned the vodka and the gin. Now, one small point here, that vodka makes that gin. And we also do another gin and vodka combination. So we use a different type of vodka, which is made from a different makeup of grains. And we use that as our 14th botanical <laughs> to make a different type, a stronger, more complex gin, because it's a stronger, more complex vodka. Right, so I'm now going to take you through. No, I'm not. Oh, I can't remember. I've done these slides ages ago. <laughs> Should have looked at them on the train on the way in. There you go. Couldn't find it. <laughs> right, disadvantages. Quite a lot. Right, to make your own wash, into the, which you'll then distill, you need quite a lot of equipment and quite a lot of space. We'll go through all that, the actual processes, but it takes up an awful lot of space. And also because you're brewing a beer, wash, whatever you want to call it, cleanliness is quite high. So we'll go through a bit of that as well, but you have to become a quality person and have all this different equipment for measuring bacteria unless you want a bit of bacteria. A little bit of bacteria in distilling is quite good. In beer, they get upset. <laughs> Especially the washers, which we will see in a bit, we don't actually boil them. So they go into our Adam's ferment fermentation room, into a fermenter, which has to be called the wash fermenter, HMRC rules. Um, and it's in a room with lots of others with beer in. And the brewing staff sometimes get slightly excited and put plates out everywhere to see what bacteria is accumulating around the wash fermenter because it's not boiled and all the beer has been previously boiled. Okay, so time, everything takes longer. You, you know, you can't just buy in a metal drum of neutral grain spirit. You've got to ferment it. You've got to buy in all the ingredients. You've got to brew it. You've got to then ferment it. You've then got to process it into a low wine and it takes lots of equipment, lots of time. Hope I'm not putting you off. Kirsty, you do it. Um, expertise, you need to know slightly more. And you need to have people you can call on to help you. You won't be able to do it on your own. Trust me, you don't want to. 
it's a lot of work. But I have a brewing team. Don't tell them I said I have. <laughs> <laughs> We're amongst friends. Let's say I'm not your brewing team. We make beer. Okay, waste beer. So um, when we make a wash, which we'll go, we'll, then we'll go through, 32,000 litres the, the brew house team make for me. 32,000 litres. It takes up a lot of room. And when you distill that, there's only about 2,000 litres of that you want. You need to find somewhere to put the other 30,000 litres. You can't put it down the drain. They get upset. <laughs> okay? In fact, they send you letters. And you might have to buy a new suit or end up with one with stripes on it. Or arrows pointing upwards. Not good. But it is slightly illegal. There's, there's certain things you can and can't put down the drain. And you will, if you start brewing, you will end up with a big sheet of things you can and can't put down a drain. What temperature it has to be, what dissolves solids, pH. And they do check it. We have it checked every week. We check it ourselves, but they also come to site to take samples away to check our effluent of the water we put down a drain. You also need a lot of water. Um, but again, we'll come to that. But you do have a, s a slight advantage. You have a co-product to sell. When you have mashed in and you've separated your liquid from your solids, you have lots of grain. That's a co-product. You can sell that, but it will have lots of legislation as an animal food product as well, um, which we'll also touch on. And space I put on there, it takes up an awful lot of room. You need somewhere to not only brew and to distill, but you need somewhere to hold your waste, to collect your waste. Big tanks, lot, you know. Greenfield site would be great. We're in the middle of a small town. We struggle for space. We have to knock things down to put new things up. Keeps you busy. Right, we'll go a bit onto the, the actual making of a neutral ground spirit now, or a vodka. We make vodka because we make vodka because we sell vodka and then we use our vodka to uh, make our gin. But neutral grain spirit and vodka, pretty similar. Slightly different regulations um, pertaining to <coughs> vodka, really, and the amount of methanol, but we'll come to that as well. So vodka, or neutral grain, can be any, can be any source of starch from an agricultural source. Um, so here we have, it's got to be converted into sugars, because sugar then ferments. Do we need to go into yeast? We'll come to yeast. Okay, so percentage of starch, sugar by weight. Um, barley, fantastic, that's why we use it. 65% starch, which mostly can be converted, converted into sugars, which mostly will ferment into alcohol. Um, those of us who use potatoes, we don't, terribly messy. Only 17-ish percent starch. That's right, isn't it? We get nods, nods from the back. Um, grapes about the same. Uh, and most things are about sugar beet again is about 17-18% sugar um, but barley is obviously a lot higher but slightly more work right other sources fruit I use tubers instead of potatoes sounded posher <laughs> okay milk and um, people do make vodka from milk there is one company and molasses and if you have molasses and you process molasses you can make rum never a bad thing um, but obviously you can't make it into gin after you've distilled it, unless you distill it to above 96%. Right, grain, yield. This is malted barley on a table, poured out. I got told off for not clearing it up. Uh, I thought it looked quite nice, but apparently the next day it wasn't quite so nice, it gone everywhere. Okay, LPA is litres per alcohol per tonne of grain, and we achieve in Southwold about 400 litres of pure 100% alcohol per tonne of malt that we use. Um, 425 put on there because that is what the Scotch whisky industry would like to try and achieve, 425 litres of alcohol per tonne. But there are various things you can do to get that, which again we're going to go through. Um, so 400 is not bad, I don't think. We certainly, when we first started, we were more like 340 litres. So we've got it to 400 by changing our brewing methods. Distilling method hasn't really changed, but changing the way it goes through the brew house has changed quite a lot. So the brewing team have learnt something new, with my help. Okay, so we're now going to go actually into the operation. This is the picture of a GEA Huffman Millstar. 
from Southwold taken last week. <laughs> and that's actually milling at the time. We use a wet conditioning mill, so massive hopper above and all the malted <coughs> barley. We use malted um, grains. All our grains are malted. That is because what happens in the maltings is enzymes break down the cell walls around the starch, so you have protein cell walls, so you need to break those down because we need access to the starch. So that's what happens in the maltings. And then when you, when you, when you get into the brewing side of things, you'll have different colours and different levels of, of, of kilning to give you different types of malt, but we don't worry about that, we just use pale ale malt. So this isn't actually barley, because you can see it's quite dark. So I think this was for a dark beer. So it's, sorry, it is barley, but it's not all pale ale malt. There's some black malt in there. I think this was for, yeah, I think a new beer we've done called, oh, adverts, we'd have to do that. Um, Blackshaw, anyway. <laughs> okay, um, so the grist size, after it's gone between the rollers, this is a wet conditioning roller, they get wetted before they go through. We don't want to grind it to a flour, we want it to be quite whole, but still allow access for water. All right, if we keep the grain quite whole, we can use it as a filter bed later on. That's really important when you come to separate your liquid from your solids. So grist size is very important. Going through the mill, mashing in. So this is a picture, tank. I really struggled with this because it was really steamy when I was trying to take a photo. And, and with the door shut, it looked fine, but since I opened the door to take a picture, oh, it's not good. Anyway, it was, bad. it was a bad photo day. So you can see it's quite steamy. And this is the mash just before it ran off. So the temperature when you mash in, again, extremely important. Inside, from inside barley, malted barley, are two enzymes called alpha amylase and beta amylase, great names. Basically, they work at different temperatures. One likes about 63 degrees, one likes about 69 degrees. So depending on the temperature of your mash while you're mashing, and while you're doing your starch conversion, you'll get different types of sugars because one of these enzymes likes to cut big chains of sugars called dextrins. They don't ferment very well. But if you're making beer, you want sweetness in a pint. If you're making a, ma a wash for a distillery, there's no point making sugar that can't be fermented because sugar doesn't distill, as you know. The other one, alpha amylase, makes the little tiny sugars, maltose, mainly maltose, fructose, and some glucose, ferments really well. So that's the, what you need to do. So the temperature when we're making a wash is different to when we're making a beer. And it's more in the 63 degrees end of scale. And also what we'll also do, we do a stepped mash. So we might mash in at 52 degrees, do a prote what they call a proteolytic stand to break down extra proteins, and then up that steadily to 63 degrees, and then keep it at that, and then take it to 75 to slow the enzymes down but not stop them. So you want maximum amount of sugars. You do a sacrification check which is always good fun, and we all know from school, I didn't. If you take a white tile and put some of your mash on the tile, squirt some iodine on it, if the iodine stays brown, all the starch is converted to sugars. If it goes black, there's still some starch remaining, so you leave it for a bit longer. And we still do that when we have new season's malt, and very when the boss is there, they'll do that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to check the sacrification, but if he's not there, they go, click, move it on. But new seasons not, they will do it. So we need to separate everything. So it takes about an hour. We then need to separate our liquids from our solids. This is an extremely complicated louter turn. You don't need to go to this level. It's a big sieve, very big sieve. We, we, we're using about seven tons, six to seven tons of malt at a time. Obviously, you don't really need to go that big. Um, this has knives that lift the bed and also it's all computer controlled. If the, it's all about differential pressure, but beneath the plates to above the plates. If it gets too high, the knives come down and lift all the grain up. Everyone's got one of these, haven't they? <laughs> what do you mean, no? Um, so this, and you do it for so much until you get it really dry, you sparge hot water on top to wash out all the remaining sugars. You need to get all the sugar out, and you're left with spent grain, still very high in protein, fibers, things like that, which then can go on as a co-product for animal feed. But not as long as it's not too wet. They, again, they get upset if it's too wet. They don't give you so much money for it. But yeah, it is, is a co-product. You can sell it for quite a lot of money. Although for the female bit, as the regulations you have to adhere to if you want to sell it as a co-product. And believe me, there's more regulations to do with animal feed than there is to do with beer. Yeah, which is, you know, something for the quality manager to do. You've got one of those, haven't you? <laughs> right, yeast. We love yeast. As brewers, yeast is our thing. 
And I'll tell you a little bit of the history of Adnams yeast. Actually, we've had since 1941. So there was a bit of a story associated with 1941. Apparently, the yeast we had had an infection. They thought, oh, I can't be doing with this. They threw it all away. Now, you would never do that nowadays. And basically, we went to another brewery in Norwich called Morgan's. It's not there anymore. And said, can we have some of your yeast? So we went along with our buckets, apparently. Right? Got some buckets of yeast, went back to Adnams, and they've had that yeast and kept it going ever since. Morgan's, just as a bit of an aside, burned down two weeks later. But there was a war on, apparently. So, yeah. So they no longer use that yeast. They never start up again. So we now have that yeast. And, but it's two strains. Really, really awkward. And gives us a slight nightmare. If we don't, it's called class one and class three. Single cell fungus. Lovely, brilliant piece of stuff. Yeast. Love it. Got big books on it if you want to borrow it. Never <laughs> read them. Um, but yeah, so two strains of yeast. Class one and class three. And we'd like to keep them 50-50. And if we do, we get lovely fermentations. Good crop of yeast off the top. Beer looks good. Don't worry too much about the wash because it doesn't really matter. It's all about the beer. But you want a good, steady fermentation. Nice bringing it down. If they get out of kilter, out of 50-50, which they do, because one likes to live, and one likes to die, which is never a good couple, um, <laughs> all we have to do is repropagate. But they do get out quite... The further they get out, the worse trouble we have. You get bad fermentations, you get cloudy beer, you get all sorts of problems. Um, but your yeast is really important. And you can buy distiller's yeast. comes in a box. Quite expensive. But we obviously use brewer's yeast. It's free, but you have to look after it. We pitch it, we skim it, we take it back to the yeast room, we put it in lovely cold four degree centigrade tanks, very, very clean, and re-pitch it from there. So every time we pitch yeast, we probably get four times as much yeast back. Um, but occasionally they get, like I said, out of kilter, out of, not 50 50 anymore, so we actually propagate. Our yeast is kept off site. We actually keep slopes of yeast in a yeast bank. It's so important to us, we actually pay someone to look after it and then get it from them occasionally. They'll grow it for us on a medium, then we'll get it from them and then grow it up in a lab, greater and greater quantities until we've got enough to then grow in a yeast room in a propagation vessel. It gets, But you don't need to do that, you can buy it in a box. But, and also distiller's yeast will be able to ferment some of the sugars that our yeast can't. So you might get nearer to that, that 425 holy grail of litres of alcohol per tonne. Um, but brewer's yeast, you know, we use it because we've got it. So this is fermentation. This is some fermenting beer. Yeast head on top. And here we've got the tools needed to monitor your fermentation. So we have sacrometers. They're not hydrometers. These are sacrometers. Um, so they'll be dropped into... The sample can be taken. We don't use these anymore, but we've got one just in case. We have a sample tap and pumps. But this is a, a dropper, a sinker, that you can put the, the orange bit goes into the hole, you can drop it in, you give it a tug at whatever level you want in your liquid, it fills up, you pull it up. So the sample's not always from the top, you can take it from anywhere. And then we'll put that into a tall jar, drop a sacrometer in and it will float at a certain level and it will go down steadily as the fermentation goes on and you can monitor your fermentation that way. But you have to keep it clean. And any sample you take out you have to throw down the sink or drink it, it's quite sweet. And normally hoppy if it's beer. Okay, so you need to monitor your fermentations. Most fermentations, with a wash anyway, three days. With a beer you would then do a cold maturation, which we have done with washes as well. It changes the flavour, the flavour changes, and which you distill that flavour. So things that the yeast produce during that time, they'll actually give you esters and lots of other flavours that you can carry through. And certainly with a whiskey you would, with a vodka it's not so important because you're going to get it a bit hot and distill it, but it will taste differently. Right, hygiene. As a distiller, not such an issue um, because everything gets very, very hot for quite a long time and you don't really have a hygiene problem. As a brewer, hygiene is the holy grail. And this piece of kit that I've took a picture of here, which is measuring but not because I haven't put a sample in it, um, it's measuring ATP. So ATP, Q8, ATP is part of the building blocks of life. And you measure that, it's in your muscles, it's everywhere. It's, it's the energy converter. 
So if you can measure that in your sample, you've got something in your sample that's alive or recently died. So this piece of kit is really easy to use. You have a swab, you open the fermenter door, you swab around side, inside the door. This is after it's been cleaned. Don't bother doing it when it's not been cleaned. It will be full of, full of bugs. Okay, so you wipe around the inside of the door, put it in this machine, press a button. It actually uses, um, it's from fireflies. You know fireflies emit light? Um, in the liquid, when you shake it, there's some chemical that is also used in the backsides of fireflies that makes this emit a light, and this machine measures that light. So if there's something alive in your sample, inside this machine, they'll measure the amount of light that's emitted by your sample. And I'm not even sure how much that costs, but it's really clever. <laughs> okay, so this will tell you where you've got a cleanliness problem and if you have to re-clean or not re-clean. Because that's all you can do is re-clean. So caustic, acids, all sorts of things. The cleaning regime is huge. But there are companies out there who will help you, who will come along because they sell you the chemicals. But they'll tell you what you should be doing. And we, we, we've been doing it for 140 years and we still use these companies. Because new chemicals come all the, out all the time and they will come along and say, oh, don't use that caustic anymore, use this one. It's slightly better. Or use a nitric acid instead of a orthophosphoric. But you have to be careful with that because if you're stainless steel equipment, nitric acid will eat big holes in it. And when you've paid several million pounds for it, the last thing you want is big holes or cracks appearing, stress corrosion. Distillation, I'm going to go over my time, and that's a first. <laughs> Okay, I'm normally going to questions. Right, first distillation of tanning low wines. So the wash we've made, six, no, I talked about brew for a long time, as you see. Right, um, the low wines we've made, six to seven percent alcohol. Now you can make stronger, but we found by, by giving stuff at about six, six percent ish, our yeast really worked really well to give us that 400. When we first started um, distillations and making washes to distill them, we were making washes about eight percent. I found that we were getting that low 340, 350 litres of alcohol per tonne of mole by actually chucking some water in, making it more dilute, lowered the ABV, but our yeast worked a lot better. Because it's beer, it's brewer's yeast, it's not distiller's yeast. So it, it got stressed. So through this piece of kit, these are quite efficient. I know we don't all you have one, but it's a beer stripping column, wash goes in the top, comes down through a series of plates, very hot, 103 and a half degrees at the bottom, vapor going up, stripping all those alcohols yeah. out. And in the top, in the copper section, you get a, a small rectifying section. So from 6%, this continuous process is giving us a low wine about, well, it's not really low, 80% ABV. I've had it up to 92%, but it's not that efficient. But 80%, 75 to 80% is how we run it to try and keep it, get our maximum yield. So it's a continuous process, those 32,000 litres just working through normal 6.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon will take about five days um, of that thing running. It's really hot, really noisy. The pump squeaks. <laughs> Drives you mad. Unless you service the pump, obviously. That'd be expensive. New pumps are not squeaky at all for about two weeks. E, e, e. Slightly annoying. So after that, we take our low wine and we rectify it. So we have a pot still for those gin distillers. They've all got a pot still, but connected to our pot still is a rather tall column. Now we had a height restriction. We're already at floor one, so we're at first floor before we start. So our column is split into two halves, uh, but it works exactly the same way. The volatiles from the pot still go into the bottom of the first column, start making their way up through the plates goes down to the second column, makes their way up through those 20 plates, so 40 plates. And you need 40 plates because you need to get above 96%. And it's quite a slow process. Right? You have to run it quite slow. Um, I'm afraid for 330-ish litres of alcohol, we're talking a 12-hour distillation, and a lot of water. You need an awful lot of water. So apart from our final condenser, which we've all got. There's another five on this. So we actually, I, because we have a, uh, a new guy who does, who's worried about carbon footprint, which I was never that concerned about, but apparently it's a big thing. <coughs> and he said, how much, how, many, um, how much water do you use to make vodka? 
I didn't really want to tell him, but we had to put a flow meter in and measure it. To make in a gin distillation, we use three cubic meters, right? Quite a lot, three cubic meters. You wouldn't, you could bath in it, you could swim in it, right? On a vodka day, one day, of which there are six, and to get one wash into all into thing, 22 cubic meters, a lot of water. So they're now working out the carbon footprint of a bottle of gin. I'm not confident it's going to be low, <laughs> right? <laughs> not confident at all, at all. Vodka will be slightly better because it's then not made into gin. Um, but the vodka bit does ruin it a bit. The stripping is quite good. About 40 cubic meters for 32,000 liters. So yeah, so carbon footprint, but the bottle's quite high. <laughs> Probably still higher than the, the, the liquid in it. Yeah, glass, not good. So number of plates, 40, 42, to get your 40% alcohol. I'm sorry, 96% ABV. EU definitions of vodka, just so we know, which you probably all know anyway, um, has to be above 96% and has to have a methanol content of 10 grams per hectolitre. Quite low, but 10 grams is really low. And if you're buying your spirit, you'll specify that anyway. And requirements for London Dry has to be distilled above 96%, but the methanol content has to be less than 5 grams per hectolitre. Now, how do we achieve this? Because methanol is a bit of a pain. <laughs> With our grain distillation, going through the columns as I've shown you there, we get a methanol content of about 9. So we are within the methanol requirements. But obviously, Mr. Adams wasn't happy with that. And you could distill it all again, but that's quite costly. And another 22 cubic metres of water. So what we do, we have this column. In fact, there's probably a better picture on the cover of this. There is. The one in the middle. Big, tall, stainless one. That's a packed column, DMF column. How to do that? It's a third distillation. It's actually a continuous distillation as part of the batch distillation. So the batch distillation makes a 96% alcohol. Then you do your cuts, heads, hearts and tails. The heart section is diverted into the middle of this column. And it works sort of upside down. The ethanol, 96% goes in, rains down. At the bottom is a tiny pot still. And in a continuous process with ethanol going in, methanol is the distillate. Right, so we distill off this, collect it, and then do something with it. Don't drink it. <laughs> it's really bad for you. Go yellow and everything, and blind, and dead. <laughs> <laughs> if you drink too much. Anyway, so we extract our methanol by using this column in our single in our single day, single vodka day, going from low wine into um, drinkable, sellable vodka. Um, we get our methanol content down to less than one gram per hectolitre, so less than a tenth of the legal requirement. Um, which you can, a big, massive, continuous ethanol plant probably gets lower than that anyway. Probably negligible. But obviously this is a batch process by a little old brewery in Southwold. <laughs> okay, so we get it as low as we possibly can. And it, you can actually taste it. If you were to taste, because um, I did this when we first set this up, if you taste it before it goes into that methanol column and afterwards, you taste the two products, you can actually taste the difference quite easily. So methanol, even at 10 grams per hectolitre, is quite prevalent. You can taste it. Even though the legal requirement for apple spirit, for example, is 1,000 grams per hectolitre, a litre in 100. Still won't kill you, but there's a lot of methanol. And we have to be less than 10, and we actually get it down to 1. But you can still taste it. It's got quite a high flavour profile. I didn't bring any with me. Could have done. And now we're going to have a methanol tasting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call the ambulance. <laughs> right, I do believe that's it. <laughs>